So I've been wearing this microphone for an hour, and it has not done that once. Welcome to Journey of Life. We have been going through a sermon series looking at the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah and what the Messiah would do for us, what the Messiah would be for us. The New Testament, of course, has a ton of stuff about Jesus, but what we are trying to do in the contemplative and sort of uh, expectant season of Advent is, is kind of think about Old Testament life and, and what they would be looking for in the Messiah. What does the Old Testament tell us about the Messiah who would be coming? And we looked at the Messianic lineage. We looked at uh, the ancestors of Jesus. And what we saw was Jesus, the Messiah, has an earthly lineage by which we can identify him. But he has a heavenly lineage also. He comes from the Father. And when he comes into the world, he doesn't come into the world to go back alone. He comes into the world to take us with him. And so his lineage becomes our lineage. And then we looked at the land, the land of Jesus, and uh, the Bible tells us in the Old Testament that Messiah would be someone who could reasonably said to come from Nazareth, to be born in Bethlehem, and also come out of Egypt. And so that further narrowed the field of who this Messiah could possibly be. And then as we looked at Jesus, we saw that he, he certainly had earthly land he had come from, but he also came from eternity. Um, the prophecies tell us that the one who was coming would come from old, from everlasting. He actually comes out of the land of heaven. And so like, as he comes from God's family to adopt us into God's family and bring us home, we get adopted into God's lineage. He comes from God's land. He comes into our land, not just to wave at us and leave, but so that he can hold our hand and bring us back to God's land. And then last week, we looked at his life. We looked at what the Messiah would look like. What, what, would his, the, what would his life look like? What would his ministry look like? And we saw that he comes into the world to bring this ministry of love and reconciliation and redemption. And then he says, as I, the Father sent me, no, now I send you. And so, like he brings us to his land and he brings us into his lineage, he also brings us into his life and says, this is now your life. This is the work of your life. And that's kind of where we're closing off today. We want to look at what the Bible says the Messiah would do for us. What would the Bible, what would the Messiah accomplish on our behalf? This person who comes from the Father, who, whose lineage includes God himself. And I, I've got, uh, I got five shuns. This is shunning Sunday. Yes, you can, you can say we shun at our church. <laughs> but we're not going we're not going to push anybody away. These are big these are five sort of uh, theology words I want to I want to infuse with meaning for you because they kind of get sometimes they get passed off like the Lord is our Jesus is our expiation or he's our propitiation or things like that. And and, and those words can sound like uh, oh that's for somebody else, but it's not. Each one of those words is for us and they tell us Different things Jesus does for us. And, and of course, uh, um, people who are uh, uh, trying to define things very narrowly and accurately, the scholars, um, they try to go after the definitions of these words and define them very narrowly, but that's not what I want to do today. Uh, we're going to pop, we're going to go by there. But what I really want you to do is hear these different words as different ways that God speaks to us in his son, Jesus Christ. The Bible says in these last days, he has spoken to us through his son, Jesus Christ. And so these are different things that, uh, that God brings to our lives through Jesus Christ. And uh, some of them will resonate with you and they'll hit you in a place of meaning. And some of them will seem like abstract theological truth. And what I'm saying to you is don't, uh, the place I want everybody to go today is where do these hit me? Not the abstract theological truth thing. Because each one of these, some of these words are going to mean something for you, and some of them are just going to be big words that don't really do anything for your spirit right now. The first word I want to give you, the first shun, is expiation. 
It's the act of making amends or reparation for guilt or wrongdoing. It's atonement. And what we're looking for, we, we, we're not going to cover all of Jesus' work because we're trying to stay in the Old Testament. And by the way, this is in your bulletin if you want to. Uh, it's sort of, it, the, all, the, all this material is in your bulletin. Expiation, the act of making amends or reparation for guilt or atonement. The expiation moves your guilt away. X is like exit, like out. Exit moves your guilt away. And uh, in Isaiah 53, which is one of the major prophecies about the Messiah, it tells us about God uh, moving our guilt away. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity, the guilt of us all. And so for some of us, it, it really is going to mean a big, big, it's going to mean a great deal to hear that, that the work of Jesus was expiation. Because some of us carry a load of guilt. And guilt is like, uh, guilt is a, I'm trying to think of a good example. Guilt is like a load that weighs, anybody, anybody backpack here? Anybody like to go backpack here? <coughs> All right, we won't use that again. <laughs> anybody ever had to carry something kind of heavy, a distance? Most of us in, in, in one time or another have. Have you noticed that it gets harder and harder? The longer you carry this heavy thing, the harder it gets, right? And guilt is like that. Some of us carry guilt from a long, long time ago. I have some things that for some reason my mind won't let go of. I, I feel, and I think I, I shared this before, I, I uh, made my little brother cry when I was nine. And he was seven. And uh, he was, well... I'll tell you the story. We were at the beach, and he had a, uh, a piece of seaweed, and he was playing like it was a snake. Maybe I was six and he was four. That sounds more like it. And uh, I have apologized to him, by this way, for him. And he was playing like it was a snake, and I'm a quiet person. Like at the beach, I like to just sit and read. That's my thing. I just want to sit and read. And uh, I, even when I was a kid, that's what I wanted to do. And he came over with this wet, slimy thing, and I hate seaweed. Anyone here hate seaweed? Like you're at the beach and it wraps around your ankle and you're like, I can't stand it. So he comes over here with this thing and he starts going snakey snake or whatever he's doing. And I grabbed it and I ripped it up. And you know what happens with a little kid, right? When something like totally unexpected and horrible happens, they just stand there and cry. And so, I, you know, that, that's, that's a light thing. But some of us carry really big pieces of guilt around us. And you might be the person today who needs to hear the word of expiation. What you need to know is this, when I say that heavy thing you carry around with you, some of you are like, oh, heck yeah. You need the word of expiation today. You need to hear the word that Jesus came to take that and exit it from your life. To get rid of it, drop kick it, go post of wherever so it's gone. That thing, as far as God is concerned, that is gone. And you need to hear that today, and I pray that you can embrace that with faith today and say, even though these things pop up in the back of my mind, I am going to speak faith over them. I'm going to speak the words of Jesus over them, and I'm going to, I'm going to hear the word today. Your sin is forgiven. It is separated from you as far as the east is from the west, and that is quite a kick from the east to the west. That's how far that thing has gone. And so expiation might be your word today. If you need it, the word of expiation you have it today. It's the, it's the Old Testament prophecy about what the Messiah will do, and it is what Jesus did for us. The second word is propitiation. The act of appeasing, placating, winning, or regaining favor. And Isaiah also talks about our salvation, the Messiah, the coming Messiah, in terms of propitiation. Uh, verse 10, his soul makes an offering for guilt. In verse 12, he bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. So that, that uh, expiation is that weight of guilt and getting rid of it. The propitiation is the fear of an angry God and, 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 and heading that off. That's what propitiation is. The, the appeasing of your perceived wrath of God. And, and for some people... Uh, this doesn't mean anything. They don't even think of God as an angry God. But for some of us, we walk around wondering how God feels about us or thinking we actually know how God feels about us, and it's not very nice. It's not very good. 
He's pretty mad at us. He's not really happy with us. He's scowling at us. Really, I expect better of you. That's some of our gods. I expect better of you. And the word of propitiation is that God is not angry with you. God, God does not walk in wrath toward you. You don't have to be afraid because of Jesus. You don't have to be afraid of God's angry punishment over your life. It's gone. It's taken care of. It is... Uh, his soul has made the offering for our guilt. He is the one who bore your sin and he made intercession for us. He, the intercessor is the one who stands between. You need to know, I'm not telling you that, that, that uh, sin isn't abhorrent to God. It is. What I am telling you is that there is an intercessor. There is one who stands between and it is Jesus. And so if you think... That, that God is angry at your sin or angry at you or something, you need to know that when you trust in Christ, you have an intercessor, someone who stands between you. And there is no anger. The Bible says God absorbed, uh, the Bible, Jesus absorbed all that on the cross. The anger of God is gone. It is peace. So that might be a word for today. You might think God is a little ticked off at you, that God's holding on to his grudge. Vengeance is mine, and he's looking for you. And the Bible says all that is taken away in the Messiah. So your word might be propitiation. The next word is reconciliation. The act of restoring harmony or friendship. The Messiah is also prophesied to be a reconciling. Messiah, one who will bring people together. And the Bible says it's by faith. It's just simply by trusting him. He will make many be accounted righteous, and he will bear their iniquities. He will make them accounted righteous. Righteous, the best way to think of righteous, I think, a simple way, is right with God. He will make you right with God. He will be the reconciler. There, the Bible says there's nothing you can do. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely. They are made right in Jesus Christ. You are right with God right now. You are reconciled with God in Jesus Christ. This may be the word for you. Your word might be reconciliation today. You might feel like there's a rift between you and God. Maybe there is. It's not on God's side, though. If there's a rift between you and God, guess whose rift it is? It's yours. God never turns around and walks away from us, but sometimes we turn around and walk away from God. You might need the word of reconciliation today. That in Jesus, we are brought back together with God. Our relationship with God is made whole. The word of reconciliation. The fourth word is redemption. The act of saving or being saved from sin, error, or evil the act of regain, regaining or gaining possession of something in exchange for a payment, a clearing of a debt. And the Bible says, uh, again in Isaiah, all these are from Isaiah, is that redemption is also one of the messianic words, the things that God does for us. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. So he paid the price for our sin. That's what the Bible says. Some of us walk around going, yeah, but, you know, some of us are like realists, like, uh, someone's got to pay. I've done this and someone's got to pay. The Bible says that Jesus already paid. That's redemption. He paid the just penalty for our sin. And I'll tell you, some people, this, this uh, the reason I want you to think about different words and just kind of own them as the as the picture the messianic picture you need at the moment is because some of these ring true and some of these present <coughs> difficulties for us i will tell you the one that has that presents difficulty for me is, is the angry god the, the god the god who uh who justly wants to like you know step on me and, and grind me into the ground I have trouble seeing that as 
having ever been a true picture of God. And I, the Bible presents it that way, and, and, and I'm not saying it's not a truth, but it's hard for me because Jesus constantly says things about him being our father. And I can't imagine ever feeling that way about my children. And so I wonder, how, how does that fit in? But, but these are all different pictures of God, and, and some of these pictures ring true to each of us. And it's a picture of redeeming, of buying back, of, of having this like great debt, weight on our shoulders, things we, something we owe to God, uh, to become worthy, this idea of having to be worthy in ourselves, uh, of having to do enough or be enough. This is an idea that propagates through our culture a lot. And so the idea of Jesus, of the Messiah, being our redemption is a big one for us because you need to know, yeah, your boss is going to evaluate you and other people are going to evaluate you. Uh, and and, and uh, sometimes uh, you're going to be accepted or rejected based on your merit. That's the way it works in this broken world. But in God's economy, it doesn't work that way. In God's economy, your acceptance is simply based on his love. You are redeemed. Whatever you think stands between you and God, whatever, whatever debt you think is paid, whatever enough you think you have to be that you're not, that is not true in God's economy. You simply are, and so you are loved. You are God's creature, and you are loved. The Bible says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You are loved right now. You are redeemed right? So we have expiation, getting rid of that weight of guilt that's on our shoulders. We have propitiation, someone standing between us and the God we think is angry at us and appeasing him. We have reconciliation, this, this, we think there's some sort of chasm between us and God and the Messiah brings that back together. And we have redemption, that, all, that whatever debt we think we owe God, whatever worthiness we think we have to work up to, is already paid for in Jesus. And I, the last one is uh, my personal favorite, as a matter of fact, adoption. The act of taking by choice into a relationship. By all the way, these, all these definitions are from the internet, so they must be true. <laughs> Adoption is the act of taking by choice into a relationship. Now, most of you know that I'm adopted. Those of you who've been here at, at any time at all, I was adopted out of the hospital, so there was no, you know, there's no, there was no IQ test to say yes, I want to adopt a smart man or anything like that. I was, you know, adopted right from birth. And uh, when you're adopted from birth, you realize there's nothing you did. There's nothing, there's no way you were, you somehow showed your worthiness. Or, or won a contest against seven other babies for, for who gets chosen from the lineup. You just were adopted and somebody chose, they made the choice to take you into a relationship and to love you. And the Bible says that's what God does for us. One of the strangest things in the Bible is that David is a man after God's own heart. Has anybody ever wondered why in the world, I, I, what singles David out? David is a man after God's own heart. David did some horrible, horrible, horrible things. David does, has, did things that make me want to use bad words when I describe them. They're so bad. But for some reason, the Bible says David was a man after God's own heart. We've talked about that before. One of them is, is that he was simply just, when the truth hit him, he was repentant. He confessed and whatever. He was just like, he was not there to self-justify. But I found this other thing. And, and one of the things about prophecy is sometimes it's like verbal and sometimes it's in people's lives. David did something wonderful to a man named Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth. Now, Mephibosheth was the grandson of Saul. You may recall that Saul was king before David. And Saul turned away from God, and so God rejected Saul and said, I'm going to set up a new king. And that's when, through this long, long process, there's always a process, we don't have to go into it, David was anointed king. And so, but for a time, Saul had like, the Bible says he kind of had a demon or had like these fits come over him, and, and so they got, they actually brought David into the palace 
to play the lyre for him because David was an accomplished musician and his music would calm down Saul. But every once in a while, it wouldn't calm down Saul. Saul would look at David and hate him. And one time, David's like playing the lyre and Saul grabs his spear and hucks at her. David, being the ninja, gets out of the way. And then, and then after a while, he's really trying to kill David, and, and Saul's like marching around with his army, and we went through this a while ago, actually. And, and he's trying to kill David, and two different times, David has a chance to kill Saul, and he doesn't take it. And so Saul backs off, but then he gets angry again, and he goes after him again. And finally, the whole thing is over, and David is king. And this is where we get to uh, why I think David is a man after God's own heart. Mephibosheth is Saul's grandson. And he's lame. And, and that, was a, that was a bigger thing back then. Now we, we have a lot more. Uh, um, obviously, we don't attach any, like, your father was a sinner or anything like that to the fact that you have body parts that didn't develop properly. But his, 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 he, had, he was lame. His feet were uh, messed up. And so... After this whole thing is done, David asks his servants to go find somebody and, and says, isn't there anybody in Saul's house I can show kindness to? And he says, for the sake of Jonathan, because, because Jonathan was his best friend. And so his servants search around and they say, Saul had a son who had a son named Mephibosheth and he's lame. And David, this is what David does with Mephibosheth, who is the grandson of the man who spent years trying to kill David. Mephibosheth is the grandson of the man who spent years trying to kill David. David brought Mephibosheth in and said, bring him to my palace. He's going to live here with me. Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth was part of the enemy clan. He was Saul's grandson. And David took the grandson of the enemy and brought him into his own table and treated him like a son, even though he wasn't. And that's the adoption that God has given us in Jesus Christ. You, this, this may... I, I don't want to like hurt anybody's feelings, but you are not pure as the new driven snow. <laughs> You are not the person who deserves to sit at the table of the living God and feast on the food of eternal joy. You may not be the worst person in the world, but you are not the best person in the world either. David with Mephibosheth gives us that adoption picture of what God does for us in Jesus Christ. He brings us in and sets us at the table and treats us like sons. And that's amazing. <coughs> So I don't know which word you need today. Some of those words you might be like, ah, I really just, boy, I can't even use that word. But one of those words probably works for you today. Which one do you need? Propitiation? Well, let's do it in order. Expiation? That's the getting rid of this heavy burden of guilt. Propitiation is, this, is, is, that, is that we don't have to worry about God being angry with us anymore. Reconciliation is whatever chasm we feel like there is between us and God has been closed, brought together, restored by Jesus Christ. Redemption is whatever worthiness we think we owe, whatever work we think we're supposed to be doing to be good enough for God has already been taken care of in Jesus Christ. And adoption is that you might feel like a stranger in this world. You might feel all alone. But the Bible says that that is the work of of the Messiah is to give us that adoption as sons. One of my favorite Bible verses, just to close, is he sets the lonely in families. Isn't that a beautiful thing? I, I, I just, I don't know. For some reason that verse is like really, that's just a sweet and beautiful thing. He sets the lonely in families. So much better than turn or burn. I think. <laughs> I'll stand next. We'll, do, we'll just we'll, we'll go out on street evangelism, and uh, someone else can stand there and say, "Turn or burn." And I'll say, "He sets the lonely in families. He wants to adopt you. <laughs> you you pick." Oh, that was. I don't need to go there. <sighs> Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are 
uh, just about here to the celebration of the birth of your son. We have looked through this Advent series at prophecies, words that you gave people of old to help us identify the Messiah and to recognize what the Messiah would be and do. Father, we see in Jesus of Nazareth the man who matched your lineage, the lineage you prophesied about him, being of the house and lineage of David. We see in Jesus of Nazareth a man who came from the multiple lands that you prophesied, from Bethlehem and from Nazareth and from Egypt. We see in Jesus of Nazareth a man who lived, as you prophesied, the Messiah would live, healing, restoring, loving. And we see in Jesus of Nazareth the one who brought us what we really need. And Father, most of us here need one of these things. Some of us need the expiation. We need to hear again your words, that that burden of guilt, that heaviness we've been carrying around is, is taken away in Jesus. Help us hear that this morning in a new and fresh way. Some of us need to hear that word of propitiation because we think that you are just ticked off at us, that you frown on us, and you have that, you could have done so much better look. So we need to hear that word of propitiation, that, that whatever anger we think you might have toward us has been appeased, has been taken care of, that our favor with you has been restored through Jesus. Father, some of us need to hear the word of reconciliation. We just feel like there's a, a big chasm between us and you, and, and that it's there, and we have no idea how to cross it. We know, have no idea what we could do to come close to you again because you feel so far away. Help us to have, to, to have ears to hear that word of reconciliation and the Messiah, that you have brought yourself close to us in Jesus, that in him we are, in fact, reconciled. Help us to hear that word. Help us to hear your word of redemption if that's what we need, Father. That whatever, whatever we think of as against, standing against us, that somehow the balance is against us or we've messed things up so bad that, that we could never be part of your kingdom and have things like peace and joy that you promised. Help us to hear that word of redemption, that peace and joy are ours as we turn to you in faith in Christ Jesus. And for those of us who feel alone, Help us to hear your word of adoption. That, uh, that though we might not, not naturally belong at your table, that might be realistic enough. But you look on us with love, and you call us into your kingdom and adopt us as your sons and daughters in Jesus Christ. Father, help us hear these words for ourselves, and also help us offer these words to people around us so that we can continue the work of Jesus Christ, that we can continue the, the bringing of his expiation and propitiation and reconciliation and redemption and adoption into the world. You've given us his mission to continue. We ask you to open our eyes and our mouths to be people who bring that into the world. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll continue as the ushers collect the prayer cards and the offerings or the prayer pieces of paper.